I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, too, thank you. I know a riddle today. Is it a good riddle? I think it's a very good riddle. Well, what is it? If you don't get the answer, will you think it's a good riddle? I certainly will. All right. Who is bigger, Mr. Bigger or Mr. Bigger's baby? Oh, Mr. Bigger, of course. You are wrong. Hmm? Mr. Bigger's baby, because he is a little bigger. Oh, you <laughs> stuck me, you caught me, you hung me on a hook. You are shaming and laughing at me right in front of everyone. What can I do to make up for my stupidity? Read me the comic. Fuck the comic weekly. Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on top of the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy has discovered that the chameleon, the leader of an outlaw gang, is Mr. Grief, one of the citizens of Buckskin. Hoppy has joined the outlaws in order to keep an eye on them until the Texas Rangers arrive to help him capture the gang. He has led the outlaws to Echo Canyon, which is on the United States side of the border, telling them that he has hid $40,000, which he has stolen, there. They arrive at Echo Canyon. Grief says, All right, this is Echo Canyon... Now show me where you hid that 40,000 you stole, Cassidy. Hoppy points to some tall crags and says, Well, it should be behind one of those crags, Grief. They all seem to look alike, though. Suddenly, a galloping rider comes toward them. The men clamp their hands to their guns. Grief says, Hey, wait, wait. It's Cabot, my bookkeeper from the buckskin office. First picture, second row, Cabot tells him, Hey, there's a party of Texas Rangers headed this way. Two bar 20 hands tipped them off where to find you. Hey, that's Cassidy's doings. He tricked us into crossing to the U.S. side of the border so the law could grab us. Reef glares at Hoppy with eyes of steel. You should have known you couldn't outsmart me that easily, Cassidy. Finish him, boys. The men reach for their guns. Hoppy beats them to the draw and hurls himself down an incline. The men fire wildly at him. Last pitch of second row. First pitch of bottom row. Hoppy takes shelter behind a huge boulder. The outlaws scatter for shelter themselves. Directly behind Hoppy, there's a huge overhanging ledge. Grief sees some rocks beginning to fall behind Hoppy, and he shouts, Keep firing! The sound vibrations are loosened in those rocks! Hoppy hears the rocks dropping behind him, and he looks back over his shoulder, and he sees the ledge behind him beginning to crumble. Hey, they got me trapped. That overhang is weakening. If it ever lets go, oh, what's keeping those rangers? Yes, he's right underneath it. I wonder if the rangers will get there in time to save Hoppy. Well, I'm sure we'll find that out next week. Now... Oh, now can we go over the page and meet Prince Valiant? We certainly can, and I'm sure that Prince Valiant will be there. I'm right, he is there. Yes, Ella's home again, and everyone is happy to know that he wasn't killed or hurt on his hunting trip. I wonder what he'll do now. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hecate, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. With Prince Valiant's return, peace settles once again over Viking's home. Arf returns to his books, Alida to the care of her brood, happy to have her adventurous husband once again at her apron strings. One day, Val goes in search of Alida to reassure himself that she's really as lovely as she thinks he is. And he sees her training a new hawk. Now, in those days, one of the forms of sports the people like to enjoy themselves with was falconry. They would train a falcon, which is a bird of the hawk family. The bird was trained to capture other birds and bring them to their master. 
Big, heavy gloves would have to be worn, for a hawk would sit on your wrists and those sharp claws would cut you. Then when you would release the hawk, he'd capture the bird in the air in his claws and bring it back to you. When Val sees Alita training a new hawk, he teases her last picture, top row. Well, what'd he be there, my pet? Is it a thrush with which to catch butterflies? Alita laughs and tells him that it's a Merlin that she has trained. And she challenges Val to see if he can do better. Val laughs and accepts her challenge. And then he sees an impish gleam in Alita's eyes. And he remembers it's a poor time of the year to catch hawks. <laughs> Nevertheless, last picture, second row, Val is out by the marshes, searching the blue skies for a falcon. At last he sees a pair of jive falcons. Quickly, he sets up a gossamer net on two slender poles, then stakes out a bird behind it, first picture, bottom row. The hawks don't see the net set up in front of the bird that's tied behind it. And then one of the hawks dives for the bird and is caught in the net. Val looks at the hawk and sees that it is in summer molt, probably still nesting. Not the best bird for his purposes, but he adjusts the hood, the leash, and the swivel by which he will prepare to train it. And then he goes to work, trying to make a first-class hunter out of it. When he comes home with the bird, Alita looks at the poor ragged thing and laughs and asks Val, is it something the dogs have worried, or do you plan to have it for supper? Val grins and vows that he'll make this ragged bird into a falcon that can defeat Alita's lovely Merlin. Oh, that was very interesting, training the bird to catch other birds. Isn't it, though? Uh, once I saw a movie of a little boy who trained a falcon. It was very interesting. And, and it'll be interesting to see if Val is a better trainer of his bird than Alita's of hers. <laughs> yes, that'll be one to see. You bet. Now, how would you like to read Donald Duck? Oh, of course I would. All right, then, let's turn over the page. And there he is, Donald Duck, good for a chuckle. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chicka chack. Let's have music to bit a quack quack. Donald is going downtown shopping, and he tells his nephew, Dewey, I'll call you every five minutes. After all this time, I couldn't bear to miss it. Okay, Uncle Donald. Downtown, Donald goes in the store to shop, and he calls Dewey on the phone. But Dewey tells him, Nothing doing yet, Uncle Donald. Okay. I'll call you from the hardware store. He calls from the hardware store. Okay, I'll call you from the drugstore. Last picture, top row, he calls him from the drugstore. Nope, no action yet, Uncle Donald. Okay, I'll call you from the cleaners. First picture, bottom row, he calls from the cleaners. Hey, it just started, Uncle Donald, hurry! Donald dashes to his car. Dashes out of the car into his house. Last picture, second row, Dewey points to a bird nest on a tree outside the window. And Donald sees one little bird shaking off an eggshell. And Dewey says, You made it, Uncle Donald. There's still three eggs to hatch. And Donald says, Bye, bye, bye. And the bird says, <laughs> coming out of his egg right outside Donald's window. Yes, it is wonderful. And maybe if you look in the trees outside your window, you might see the very same thing happen yourself. Oh, I'd love to watch a little birdie push his way out of a shell. Oh, it's wonderful. First you see his little beak coming through, then you see his head come through, next comes the shoulders, and then she'll give a great big shake and split the shell open, and there she is, a newcomer to the world. My, no wonder Donald kept calling him. Yes, no wonder. Oh, well, now? Oh, look, across the page there's Uncle Remus and he tells a bear out. And we'll read that right away. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Brown Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Next time Brer Rabbit tells Brer Buzzard something, Brer Buzzard is going to think about something else. And Br'er Rabbit is telling Br'er Buzzard a ghost story. It, it was like I said. This critter flings flour all over itself. 
and then he goes around making folks believe he was a ghost. Brer Buzzard's eyes pop out as he says, And he scared them so they all run and hid, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The folks, they left the houses and the stores wide open. So old Brer Ghost, he just walk in and he help himself. A crafty look comes into Brer Buzzard's eyes. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I has got to be getting home to me. But well, take care, Brer Buzzard. There's a storm coming up. Not too much later, last picture top row, Brer Buzzard is pouring flour over himself. <laughs> this is going to be easy. I just scares them off, and then I walk in, and I grabs the caboodle. And then he walks down the road, thinking how he looks like a white ghost, and how the people will be frightened, and how the stores and the houses will be open, and how he will steal everything. <laughs> First picture bottom row, he exclaims, Hey, Ray, I is getting wet. And then a strange thing happens to him. The rain turns the flower into sticky glue and runs into his nose, his eyes, and his mouth. And he runs for Br'er Rabbit's house. And he says to Br'er Rabbit, <laughs> And Br'er Rabbit catches on to what's happened, and he giggles as he closes the door. <laughs> hey, Br'er Buzzard, you is a mess. I just got to bake this stuff off. And Br'er Buzzard replies, Br'er Last picture, Br'er Buzzard stands in front of the fire, waiting for the flour to bake so they can break it off. And Br'er Rabbit giggles, <laughs> Br'er Buzzard, you look more like a corn pone than anything I can think of. And Br'er Buzzard opens his baked jaw and replies, Blub. And Uncle Remus says, It ain't so much what you hear. It's, uh... What you try to do about it? Oh. Well, that was a good thing that happened to Br'er Buzzard. He was going to steal, and he got just what he deserved. Yes, I think you're right, and I feel like <laughs> laughing like Br'er Rabbit does. Yes, yeah, so do I. Well, now, how would you like to laugh some more? Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> you know I'd love to read Blondie, because Dagwood does such funny things. Well, then, let's turn over to the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zim, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood's neighbors, the Woodleys, are having a problem. Tootsie says to her husband, Herb... Herbert, my vacuum is broken. Will you repair it for me? Well, I don't know if I can. He looks at her vacuum, scratches his head. No, it's no use, Tootsie. I don't know one wheel from another. How did I ever happen to marry such a dumbbell? Last picture top row, Tootsie tells Blondie... My vacuum's broken and Herbert's too stupid to repair it. Blondie tells her that Dagwood is very good at repairing things to bring it over to their house and he'll be sure to fix it. First picture, second row, Dagwood is busy taking the vacuum apart and he says cheerfully, Now first we take it apart to see what the trouble is. Tootsie looks at him, smiles, then scowls at Herb, saying... Hmm, look how intelligently he goes about it. <laughs> A few minutes later, Dagwood says, Ah, I found the trouble. It's just a matter of putting it back together. Tootsie scowls twice as furiously at Herb. Why aren't you smart like that? And then Dagwood hands the vacuum cleaner to Tootsie. Last picture, second row. There, I think you'll find it better than new. Tootsie smiles at Dagwood. Dagwood, you're a positive genius. Thank you so much. And then glares at Herb, who slinks off to home in disgrace. First picture, third row, Tootsie wheels the vacuum cleaner into the living room. Now I can get my cleaning done, thanks to Dagwood. She turns on the vacuum cleaner. But it's become a wild animal. Herbert, quick, pull out the plug. It's acting queer and I can't turn it off. Herbert steps in the doorway and grins. He sees the vacuum chasing Tootsie around the room. He sees it catch her, grab hold of her dress, and begin to pull it off. And a big grin comes on his face as Tootsie yells. Oh, Herbert, don't just stand there. It's swallowing my dress. And then... Gobbles her dress. Oh! First picture bottom row, the vacuum bag begins to swell up like a balloon. Tootsie yells. Look out! It's going to explode! Around the room they go, the bag swelling up, up, up. Oh, Herb, help! But Herb just leans back and sucks in his pipe with a big grin. And then... Oh! <laughs> Last picture, Dagwood and Blondie appear in the doorway. They see Tootsie lying on the floor without her dress. The room is covered with a mess. The vacuum cleaner is blown to a thousand pizzas. Herb is laughing his head off. And Dagwood stares in amazement and says, Hey, what's
what's going on over here? And Herb just roars. <laughs> Pardon me while I die laughing. <laughs> when that terrible thing happened to his poor wife. Well, you can't blame him in a way. She kept telling him Dagwood was so wonderful and he was no good. I guess she did speak a little too soon, didn't she? Yes, I'm afraid she did. And look at her funny look on Dagwood's face. He certainly looks surprised. <laughs> yes, he certainly does. Now, look, here's Roy Rogers under Dagwood and Blondie. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip yo <laughs> Roy, who has been doing some investigation at the lumber camp, has discovered at last that Ed Sneed is the man who has been stealing Pauline Bunyan's log. The log drive has begun. The river is filled with logs being carried to the mill downstream. Etch knows he must get rid of Roy, or else his scheme of stealing the logs will fail. He's gone after Roy with a woodsman's pike, a long spear with a sharp point on the edge. As he throws the pike at Roy, Wildwood Adown steps into the path of the pike. There's a quick shot from Roy, stopping the pole in midair, and Wildwood is saved. Etch runs for the river, leaping from log to log, sure that Roy can never catch him among the logs. Roy goes for a rowboat, first picture bottom row, and heads after him. He calls to Wildwood. Find Pauline Bunyan. Tell her Etch Sneed's men are moving her stolen logs to the sawmill. I'm going after Sneed. Carefully, Roy guides his boat near the log where Etch is balancing himself. He stands up with the lariat in his hand, second picture bottom row. I'm bringing you back alive, Etch. There's murder and log pirate in charge to your account. Yeah, you'll die trying, Rogers. Your boat will be crushed by floating timber. Roy flips his rope and... <laughs> ah, got it. And then he sees Etch tumble into the river. And then feels his boat being swung around. Uh-oh, the current's got my boat. A moment later, last picture, Wildwood gallops up to her Aunt Pauline, tells her Roy is caught in the middle of the drive. Pauline exclaims, And there's a big log jam around the bend. They'll be ground to bits when they reach it. Oh, if, if the boat is crushed by the logs, well, then Roy is up to be crushed by the logs, too. Yes, Roy is in about the most dangerous spot he's ever been in. Etch knows how to balance himself, and he has heavy shoes with nails in them, but what'll happen to Roy? Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Now let's turn over the page. And here's Flash Gordon, who has been captured by the giants from the planet Saturn. And they're taking him back a prisoner with them, and I'm anxious to find out what happens to him. Will they kill him? Well, let's read right now. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon sashkimatash. Let's have music for heroic flash. <laughs> As a Saturnian spaceship hurtles back to its home port on the moon Rhea, Flash slowly recovers consciousness, and he discovers he's a captive. Like an echo from afar comes the sound of the captain's voice as he orders, Open the valve. We gotta get rid of this thin earth air and restore our normal atmosphere. Normal atmosphere to the giant Rians is a mixture of ammonia and methane gases. The Rians breathe this air with gusto, but it's deadly poison to Flash. <laughs> Last picture, top row, choking and coughing as he fights for breath. Flash hears Captain Rube bark a sharp command. Keep the prisoner alive. I want to question him about the Earth's weapons. After that, we can get rid of him. First picture, second row. One of Rube's men goes to Flash's aid at once. A few whiffs from an odd-looking canister labeled Medigas, and the choking Earthman begins to breathe easier. Flash recognizes his benefactor as Rube's son, Sami. The Medigas seems to have a lasting effect. Somehow its almost magical properties enable Flash to breathe this new air, which a few moments before had been poison to him. The rocket coasts toward a landing on Saturn's satellite. Although only half the size of our moon, 
Rhea, the satellite, is a teeming, crowded planet, the home of a strange science and a ruthless group of conquerors who have already covered half the Earth with ice. Ooh, isn't that terrible? Flash is all alone with those big, huge giants, and one says he's getting rid of Flash after he questions him. He's going to kill him later, isn't he? I'm afraid he's going to try. Oh my, and that mean, icy Stark, who's with Dale, won't do anything to help Flash. Well, let's hope that Dale can find a way. Oh, that I, I see Stark, though, he's dumb. Because if he doesn't help, he'll be in danger, too. Yes, you bet he will. But well, we'll find out more about this next week. Now, should we read Dick's adventures? Oh, yes, please. Dick is in the early days of America, and he's been captured by Tecumseh, an Indian chief. Yes, and there's trouble between the Indians and the white settlers. So, let's turn to the very last page... The last page of all, and we'll find out more about this with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. Tecumseh had captured Dick and his father, who are expert gunsmiths and iron workers. Tecumseh had asked them to teach his Indian braves how to repair their guns. But Dick and his dad had refused because they knew if they taught the Indians how to repair their guns, those same guns would be turned against the white settlers, Dick and Dad's friends. So now they're being kept prisoners. Tecumseh, as Dick and his dad brought before him. Be without fear. I mean no harm to either of you. You are free to go. But listen to me first. And he goes on to tell them, I want my people farmers, not wanderers and hunters. I will make them soldiers, not warriors. You can teach us much, but I can only ask you. I cannot force you. Yet let me propose a bargain. And he goes on, last picture, second row. You are blacksmiths as well as gunsmiths. Let us forget guns. Instruct my people in the use of the forge and the anvil, that we may learn to make the tools of agriculture and peace. And so, first picture, bottom row. On Tecumseh's solemn word that none of this new knowledge shall be used in war against the white settlers, Dick and his dad share their know-how. They teach the Indians how to fashion iron tools. That night, last picture, as Dick is watching the stars, he sees other instructors come to the Indians, red-coated officers, the British, who slip quietly into the Indian town on the Wabash near the mouth of the Tippecanoe and enter Tecumseh's Lodge. Oh, the British, they're the enemies of the Americans. Yes, in those days they were. Well, if Tecumseh is being friendly with the enemies of the Americans, then, then maybe he was lying to Dick and his dad. That is mighty good detective work. Where did you learn to be such a good detective? From Nick Carter, my favorite detective. Well, that's wonderful. But we'll find out next week if you're right. Now, look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. I was waiting to get to this because Rusty and his friend Pete were locked up in a big cave by those two crooks. Yes, and they had lost their way in the caverns while trying to find a way out. And then they came to a river in the caverns and they saw a strange blue light. I wonder what that is. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. As the boys look at the water with the blue glow coming out of it, Pete says, Hey, what do you suppose makes all that light come up out of the water, Rusty? Well, well, gee, Pete, it's, it's the same as that blue grotto in the, in the Mediterranean. It's because that stream runs out of the cave right here, and sunlight is shining on it a few feet from here. What? Well, listen, Rusty, if, if this stream runs out of the cave, why couldn't we swim underwater and get out that way? Yeah, Pete, I was just thinking the same thing. I'm game if you are. <laughs> few minutes later, last picture, top row, they come out into the open air. <coughs> Rusty climbs out on shore. Pete exclaims, Hey, we made it, Rusty. Golly, what is this? 
A quarry? No, 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 it's sort of a canyon. Hey, give me your hand, Pete. I'll help you up. <clears throat> they helped Pete climb out. First picture, bottom row. Hey, jeepers, Pete. We're lucky we found that light spot in the cave, and we did. It's nearly sundown now. Pete looks around at the tall walls surrounding them on every side. Yeah. We better be looking for the way out while we can still see. Meanwhile, in a tavern near the abandoned house, Sir Percival and Nobbs, the thieves that stole the trophies from Mr. Miles' library, leave the restaurant where they've been waiting. They go across the street, up the road to the old abandoned house. By now it is dark. They enter the house, go to the basement. And last picture, Sir Percival stops and says, Well, here's the spot where we bury the stuff. Hand me the shovel, Nobbs. Nobbs exclaims, hey, Holy smoke, Paris. Did we leave all that loose dirt lying around? It's as good as a sign saying treasure buried here. Ooh, and now they will dig for the treasure and, and then they'll find out it isn't there because Rusty and Pete found it and they hid it in another place. Yes, and when the crooks don't find it, they'll be furious and go looking for Rusty and Pete. I hope boys find a way out, and I hope the text tells the detective what he found out, and then they come and rescue the boy. Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Now, that's all the time I have, but before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right. Mr. Comic Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.